This is chapter 14 of Jane Eyre. I have this little, uh, this little red ribbon in here. It's supposed to be a bookmark, but I put it in one of my favorite comebacks in the novel, so that's coming up this chapter. For several subsequent days, I saw little of Mr. Rochester. In the mornings, he seemed much engaged with business, and in the afternoon, gentlemen from Millcote or the neighborhood called, and sometimes stayed to dine with him. When his spring was well enough to admit of horse exercise, he rode out a good deal, probably to return these visits, as he generally did not come back till late at night. During this interval, even Adele was seldom sent for to his presence, and all my acquaintance with him was confined to an occasional rencontre in the hall, on the stairs, or in the gallery, when he would sometimes pass me haughtily and coldly, just acknowledging my presence by, um, by a distant nod or a cool glance, and sometimes bow and smile with gentlemanlike affability. His changes of mood did not offend me, because I thought that I had nothing to do with their alteration. The ebb and flow depended on causes quite disconnected with me. So sometimes when Jane runs into Mr. Rochester at Thorn in, in the middle of Thornfield, um, he'll nod really coldly and kind of just brush her off, and then other times he'll be a little bit more uh, friendly and polite. Jane doesn't take offense to his mood swings because she sees that it has nothing to do with her at all, and uh, she's not offended. One day he had had company to dinner and had sent for my portfolio, in order doubtless to exhibit its contents. The gentleman went away early to attend a public meeting at Millcote, as Mrs. Fairfax informed me, but the night being wet and inclement, Mr. Rochester did not accompany them. Soon after they were gone, he rang the bell. A message came that I and Adele were to go downstairs. I brushed Adele's hair and made her neat, and having ascertained that I was myself in my usual Quaker, twi Quaker trim, where there was nothing to retouch, all being too close and plain, braided locks included, to admit of disarrangement, we descended. Adele wondering whether the petite coffre was at length come, uh, which just means little chest or little box. For, owing to some mistake, its arrival had hitherto been delayed. She was gratified. There it stood, a little carton, on the table when we entered the dining room. She appeared to know it by instinct. Uh, my box, my box, exclaimed she, running towards it. Yes, there is your box at last. Take it into a corner, you genuine daughter of Paris, and amuse yourself with disemboweling it said the deep and rather sarcastic voice of Mr. Rochester, proceeding from the depths of an immense easy chair at the fireside. And mind, he continued, don't bother me with any details of the anatomical process, or notice, or any notice of the condition of the entrails. Let your operation be conducted in silence. Uh, and then he, he speaks in French, um, and he says, keep quiet, child, do you understand? So uh, Mr. Rochester is being pretty sarcastic with the uh, the contents of this present. He tr he says that she's going to disembowel it, like take out its insides, kind of talking about it in this like gross way that Adele's just going to go through and, and get her presents in a very uncaring uh, way. Adele seemed scarcely to need the warning. She had already retired to a sofa with her treasure and was busy untying the cord which secured the lid. Having removed this impediment and lifted certain silvery envelopes of tissue paper, she merely explained, Oh, heavens, it's so beautiful, and then remained absorbed in ecstatic contemplation. Is Miss Eyre there? now demanded the master, half rising from his seat to look round to the door near which I still stood. Ah, well, come forward, be seated there, be seated here. He drew a chair near his own. I'm not fond of the prattle of children, he continued. For, old bachelor as I am, I have no pleasant associations connected with their list. It will be intolerable to me to pass a whole evening tete-a-tete -tete with a brat. Um, tete-a-tete -tete means one-on-one -on -one or alone. Don't draw that chair farther off, Miss Eyre. Sit down exactly where I placed it, if you please, that is. Confound these civilities. I continually forget them. Nor do I particularly affect simple-minded old ladies. By the by, they must have mine in mind. It won't do to neglect her. She is a Fairfax, or wed to one. And blood is said to be thicker than water. So he, Mr. Rochester calls Adele a little bratty kid. He says that Mrs. Fairfax is simple-minded. Uh, very, very blunt and not really the nicest things to be saying. He rang and dispatched an invitation to Mrs. Fairfax, who soon arrived, knitting basket in hand. Good evening, madam. I sent to you for, charitable, for a charitable purpose. I have forbidden Adele to talk to me about her presence, and she is bursting with repletion. Have the goodness to serve her as auditress and into interlocutress. It will be one of the most benevolent acts you ever performed. So Mr. Rochester says that he um, needs Mrs. Fairfax to do a charitable kind thing and he told Adele that she can't talk to him about his present so he's asking that Mrs. Fairfax just listen to whatever Adele says to keep her entertained. 
and Adele indeed, Adele indeed no sooner saw Mrs. Fairfax than she summoned her to her sofa, and there quickly filled her lap with the porcelain, the ivory, the waxen contents of her box, pouring out meantime explanations and raptures in such broken English as she was mistress of. Now I've performed the part of a good host, pursued Mr. Rochester, put my guests into the way of amusing each other. I ought to be at liberty to attend my own pleasure. Miss Eyre, draw your chair still a little farther forward. You are yet too far back. I cannot see you without disturbing my position in this comfortable chair, which I have no mind to do. I did as I was bid, though I would much rather have remained somewhat in the shade, but Mr. Rochester had such a direct way of giving orders, it seemed a matter of course to obey him promptly. So Mr. Rochester asked that he, she move her chair closer to him. She'd rather just kind of like hang out without being in, in this direct firelight, but he says it so demandingly that she just does it. We were, as I have said, in the dining room. The luster, which had been lit for dinner, filled the room with a festal breath of light. The large fire was all red and clear. The purple curtains hung rich and ample before the lofty window and loftier arch. Everything was still, save the subdued, subdued chat of Adele. She dared not speak loud, and, filling up each pause, the beating of winter rain against the panes. Mr. Rochester, as he sat in his damask-covered chair, looked different to what I had seen him look before. Not quite so stern, much less gloomy. There was a smile on his lips, and his eyes sparkled. Whether with wine or not, I am not sure, but I think it very probable. So Mr. Rochester looks a little bit more comfortable, a little less grim, but he may also have been drinking wine because his eyes are sparkling, so we don't know how this is going to go. He was, in short, in his after-dinner mood, more expanded and genial, genial means friendly, and also more self-indulgent than the frigid and rigid temper of the morning. Still, he looked preciously, uh, precociously grim, cushioning his massive head against the swelling back of his chair, and receiving the light of the fire on his granite-hewn features, and in his great dark eyes. For he had great dark eyes, and very fine eyes, too, not without a certain change in their depth sometimes, which, if it was not softness, reminded you at least of that feeling. So apparently he's got nice eyes, and if he doesn't have softness or kindness uh, inside of them, at least it reminds you of someone with kind eyes. He had been looking two minutes at the fire, and I had been looking at this and I had been looking the same length of time at him, when, turning suddenly, he caught my gaze fastened on his physiognomy. Uh, physiognomy is where, like, your facial features, your appearance, the way that your face looks. And in the 1800s, they also believed that, based on the way that someone's uh, face looked, you could tell different uh, aspects of their personality. You examine me, Miss Eyre, said he. Do you think me handsome? I should, if I had deliberated, have replied to this question by something conventionally vague and polite. But the answer somehow slipped from my tongue before I was aware. No, sir. Ah, by my word, there is something singular about you, said he. You have the air of a little Nanette, quaint, quiet, grave, and simple, as you sit with your hands before you, and your eyes generally bent on the carpet, except, by the by, when they are directed piercingly, piercingly to my face, as just now, for instance. And when one asks you a question or makes a remark to which you are obliged to reply, you wrap out a round rejoinder, which, if not blunt, is at least brusque. What do you mean by it? So he, she, she's looking at him and kind of like studying him. And then he's like, oh, do you think I'm handsome? And she just goes, no. Um, so that's, that's my other uh, favorite Jane Eyre comeback. Uh, right, right behind, uh, how do you avoid going to hell? Keep in good health and not die. Sir, I was too plain. I beg your pardon. I ought to have replied that it was not easy to give an impromptu answer to a question about appearances that tastes mostly differ and that beauty is of little consequence or something of that sort. You ought to have replied no such thing. Beauty of little consequence, indeed. And so, under pretense of softening the previous outrage, of stroking and soothing me into placidity, you stick a sly penknife under my ear. Go on, what fault do you find with me, pray? I suppose I have all my limbs and all my features like any other man. Mr. Rochester, allow me to disown my first answer. I intended no pointed repartee. It was only a blunder. So, uh, so he, Mr. Rochester wants to know what's wrong with his appearance. Jane is really feeling awkward now and says, ah, I, I should just disown my first answer, forget that it happened. Just so, I think so, and you shall be answerable for it. Criticize me, does my forehead not please you? He lifted up the sable waves of hair which lay horizontally over his brow and showed a solid enough mass of intellectual organs, but an abrupt deficiency where the suave sign of benevolence should have risen. So that's that, um physiognomy idea that you could look at someone's facial features and the structure bone structure of their face and tell something about their personality so she's looking at his forehead um and she sees that he's he seems to have a very intellectual forehead but it's a uh, it's missing benevolence so it's missing like kindness 
Now, ma'am, am I a fool? Far from it, sir. You would perhaps think me rude if I inquired in return whether you are a philanthropist? There again, another stick of the penknife when she pretended to pat my head, and that is because I said I did not like the society of children and old women, though be it spoken. No, young lady, I am not a general philanthropist, but I bear a conscience. And he pointed to the prominences which are said to indicate that faculty, and which fortunately for him were sufficiently conspicuous, giving indeed a marked breadth to the upper part of his head. And besides, I once had a kind of rude tenderness of heart. When I was as old as you, I had a feeling fellow enough, partial to the unfledged, unfostered, and unlucky, but fortune has knocked me about since. She has even kneaded me with her knuckles, and now I flatter myself I am hard, I am hard and tough as an India rubber ball, previous, uh, pervious, though, through a chink or two still, and with one sentient point in the middle of the lump. Yes, does that leave hope for me? Hope of what, sir? Of my final retransformation from India rubber back to flesh. Decidedly, he has had too much wine, I thought, and I did not know what answer to make to his queer question. How could I tell whether he was capable of being retransformed? So, um, Mr. Rochester gives her very weird and vague information, um, about him. He says, I have a conscience, and he shows her his, his forehead, his physiognomy again. Um, you want to keep track of, of, um, what characters think of physical appearances a lot in this book, because we already know that, um, Jane is very insecure about her own physical appearance um, and, and thinks that she is not beautiful and that she's very plain and she's very self-conscious about that. So, so take what Mr. Rochester says about his physiognomy with a, with a grain of salt, um, but he says that he does have a conscience and that he used to feel very kindly towards people who were sort of uh, underdogs, so unfledged, unfostered, and unlucky, and then fortune knocked him about, so some bad stuff happened to him, he's been through something. Um, and now he's tough as India rubber, so he's he's comparing himself to an inanimate object that really doesn't have much feeling. Um, and then he says he has one one weakness, and he can still be sensitive on one point. And uh, then he asked her, "Do you think that I could be transformed back into like a person who cares about things?" And and Jane thinks that he's drank too much, which may be the case, um, and doesn't know what's uh, what's what's going on here. You look very much puzzled, Miss Eyre, and though you are not pretty any more than I am handsome, yet a puzzled air becomes you. Besides, it is convenient, for it keeps those searching eyes of yours away from my physiognomy, and busies them with the worsted flowers of the rug. So, puzzle on. Young lady, I am disposed to be gregarious and communicative tonight.